Mental health, a subject often misunderstood or ignored. Isn't it time to erase the stigma, separate fact from fiction, and have a meaningful conversation about helping those in our community who suffer from mental illness? Join us now at Connecticut's Old State House for Out of the Shadows, a conversation on mental health. A town hall meeting with educators, legislators, community leaders, medical experts, and others from around the state. Sponsored by Connecticut's Old State House, CTN, the Connecticut Network, the Civic Health Advisory Group, the Connecticut Commission on Children, Everyday Democracy, the Office of the Secretary of the State, and funded by Connecticut Humanities. Now, here's your host, Diane Smith. Good evening. The title of tonight's program, Out of the Shadows, a Community Conversation on Mental Health, was inspired by a White House initiative to create a national conversation on this very important topic. In fact, President Obama, when he announced this, used these words. He vowed to help those who have, quote, spent decades waging long and lonely battles to be heard and to help people struggling with mental illness step out of the shadows and find health. And when there is an issue of this importance, we like to make it part of our civic health conversation, something that has been so important that we've actually had a movement in the state towards civic health, led by our Secretary of the State, who's here tonight, Denise Merrill. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone coming out on this rainy night to talk about this very important topic. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how this happened, how we got here tonight, and why. A couple of years ago, uh, someone came to me. Uh, Everyday Democracy, it's a nonprofit group dedicated to the idea of spreading democracy in a community sort of way, and said, would you be willing to participate in a study of the state's civic health? And it was in conjunction with a, the National uh, Council on Citizenship. It's, it's sort of a survey of the state to see how are we connecting What's going on out there? How are people connecting with each other? Are they connecting with each other and in what ways? My interest, of course, as Secretary of the State was in voting behavior uh, and those kinds of public participations. But it goes far beyond that. And I think we have all heard that people's participation in civic life is dwindling. People are less likely to vote, less likely to join local boards, commissions, associations, le less likely in general to exhibit social behaviors. So we wanted to see if we could measure or quantify this idea. And more importantly, if people don't feel connected, where do they feel connected? Because everyone's connecting somewhere. And that's exactly what we found. So we did the survey, the Connecticut Civic Health Index, uh, two years ago now. And we found some very interesting facts uh, about Connecticut and about the citizens in Connecticut. And uh, I won't give you all the details, but there were a couple of highlights that I think is relevant uh, for tonight. Um, the survey did show that not many people in Connecticut work with their neighbors on community problems. Very small number reported that, something like 8%. That was a very low number even nationally. On the other hand, a vast majority of Connecticut residents are connected to the internet, 87% of households. I find that very interesting because it was both old and young, rich and poor. Um, also, nearly 60% of residents read a newspaper daily. So we're a very well-informed state. So already there's some sort of disconnects here, aren't there? I mean, what, what's going on here really? And while some of us feel connected to our community or government through voting, we also found that those who register and vote in smaller numbers, namely minority populations, white populations with less income or education, are apt to be more active and connected to other things, like their house of worship or their children's schools. The question of how we can get people more involved in the public life of their communities is a very difficult one, but one powerful lesson came through, at least to me and to many of us in our discussions. If they do get involved in their community and with other people in their community, it's usually because someone asked them. And that's a very simple but profound idea. And I want you to think about that tonight as we think about perhaps how we can do something to ask someone to belong to something. Tonight we focus on mental health, an essential part of civic health. We focus on mental health not just because of tragic 
incidents like the horrible shooting in Sandy Hook this year. We focus on mental health because we see the need for people to be involved with the larger world in order to be mentally healthy. The same factors that contribute to poor civic health can also exacerbate mental health symptoms, a sense of not belonging, a feeling of loneliness and isolation that you see often now in our literature, in our movies. Technology is developing amazing things. We can entertain ourselves for hours with video games, tablets, iPods, smartphones. We have video games, social networking, movies on demand. You never have to leave your room or your house to play a game or find friends. There is a hidden cost, perhaps. Are we losing the human interaction and in that process, compassion for one another. So I think from my perspective, we need to find ways to bind all of us together to make sure all members of our community know that they are not alone. And uh, without enough human interaction, we lose perspective on how our actions impact others around us. That's what civic health is all about. I look forward to tonight's discussion. Perhaps these issues will be addressed by our panel. And I thank very much everyone who helped us put this together, including our wonderful civil health panel of people. Many of the organizations who put this together tonight are represented. And I just can't get them to stop meeting. They keep wanting to do more work. It's wonderful. So uh, thank you very much to all of you for coming out tonight. Madam Secretary, thank you. The opportunity to have this conversation, both locally and nationally, arose out of a tragedy that happened right here in Connecticut, of course, just over a year ago in Newtown. Tonight we have with us Nelba Marquez Green, the mother of Anna Grace and the founder of the Anna Grace Project. Nelba. Good evening, and thank you for having me here at this critically important forum. Thank you to Diane Smith, CTN, the Old State House, and all of the participants here today. My name is Nelba Marquez Green, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am the founder of the Honor Grace Project, promoting love, community, and connection for every child and family, and the director of mental health and relational wellness for Sandy Hook Promise. Before 1214, I was the outpatient uh, clinic coordinator at Klingberg Family Centers and adjunct faculty at CCSU in the Department of Marriage and Family Therapy. I'm also the mother of Isaiah James, age nine, and Honor Grace, who should be seven. Only one of my children made it home on December 14th. It's still very hard to say that. I am one of those Newtown parents um, who lost a child in an act committed by a young man who fell through our cracks. One of my greatest joys as a therapist was having the privilege of walking alongside individuals and families in their process of recovery. I've worked in community mental health agencies and private practice I've worked in urban and suburban communities. I know firsthand how important it is to have accessible, trauma-informed, culturally relevant help for all families. And I know that the overwhelming majority of people with mental health issues are never, ever violent. Sadly, however, it's these horrific acts like Sandy Hook that get all of the attention. And then we forget Again, one of my most discouraging moments in the past few months in Washington, D.C., was spent sitting across from lawmakers explaining to me why they would not support standalone mental health legislation. Mental health laws won't help our urban communities. That's just something that would help the suburbs. I actually heard that. Um, but it is my view that as long as you have a brain and a heart, mental health impacts you. No community, no individual, no family is immune. No zip code exempts you. And creating compassionate communities that embrace people suffering with mental illness is all of our responsibility. Imagine a world where we made it uncomfortable to discuss heart disease or breast cancer. We know with these illnesses that awareness, treatment, community, and family support are essential to recovery. No one should suffer in silence. And we must let people know that there is hope. Let's attend to the hundreds of moms in our state desperately seeking mental health help for their kids, unable to find it. Let's attend to the families too afraid to speak up and ask for help, unwilling or unsure of how to get it. Let's attend to the overwhelmed school staff with too few places to refer their students, undaunted, 
knowing that even though it's not in their job description, it's the right thing to do. Let's attend to the countless agencies in our state seeing fewer dollars and higher caseloads, largely unrecognized. This is not the time to be cutting services for people seeking help or further stigmatizing people for receiving treatment. It is not the time for blaming. It is the time to admit that we have a problem. It is the time for open dialogue about mental health from our dinner tables to our boardrooms. This tragedy happened in our backyard and it makes sense to me that Connecticut would then be the state that leads the nation in effective, compassionate treatment of mental illness and open conversation. And I know we have the talent to do it. At the Anna Grace Project, we endeavor to bring everyone together, families, the business community, the nonprofit sector, clergy, schools, law enforcement, and others in an open dialogue about mental health. Our first event was attended by over 500 people. And I'm not saying this to boast about the effectiveness of our family initiative, but to recognize the great desire within this state to look for solutions. When we ask people to be connected, they came. And that's really important to remember. In my house, uh, we've had a saying since Anna's death, and that is, love wins. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. It is my way of honoring my children's lives it is my way of championing mental health and hopefully, in a very small way, contributing to allowing love to win. Thank you. I think that Nelba set the tone for this evening um, much the way that I would have, and I want to thank her for doing that um, because really this is about love winning, and it's about having the conversation that we've waited so long for. And thankfully in this state, it is going on, and it's become quite robust. Let me introduce you to our first panel of experts, Patricia Reamer is the Commissioner of DEMAS, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Pat. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to uh, Commissioner Reamer is Jocelyn Mackey. Jocelyn Mackey is with the Connecticut Department of Education. She is a consultant for school psychology and uh, education in general. Dr. Harold Schwartz, uh, Hank Schwartz, as many people know him, the Institute of Living Psychi Psychiatrist-in-Chief, the Vice President for Behavioral Health, at Hartford Hospital. And finally, to my extreme right, Megan Allen, who is a young woman, and if I didn't mention it, we intend on focusing on young people tonight, people 16 to 25 or so. Megan is a young college student uh, who has suffered with mental illness over the years and is now doing so well that you are double major in Mount Holyoke, is that right? Yes. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Um, Megan, I'd like to start with you. Tell us a little bit about your personal story so we get to know you a little. Okay. Um, I do not remember the first time that I uh, displayed symptoms of my OCD. I don't remember what my first obsessive thought was. What I do remember, though, is the fear. Um, it's an all-consuming fear. It becomes paralytic. As an obsessive thought begins, I can feel the fear moving through my body. It starts with sweaty palms, and it ends with just a paralysis of my entire body. My breathing shortens, my pupils dilate, and in my mind, the same thought repeats over and over. It's like a broken record. At the age of eight, my parents realized that there was something different about me. My third grade teacher, told my parents that there was a problem with my schoolwork. I wouldn't remember doing assignments, and I would emphatically deny doing them, but they would be there in my handwriting. And my teacher was becoming so frustrated, she didn't know how to handle. Uh, so at the recommendation of a family friend, my parents had me evaluated. And after extensive testing, uh, the, only state, the only psychiatrist in the state of Connecticut who was available finally admitted that I had OCD-like symptoms, but he wouldn't put a name on it. He wouldn't say that I had OCD because he'd never met someone so young with OCD. And because the medical literature said that most people don't display symptoms until their later teens, he refused to acknowledge me. 
Um, he just said that I had distracting thoughts and that they would go away. As time progressed, these distracting thoughts became more consuming. I was engulfed in a nightmare. The obsessions took a morbid turn, and instead of just having these happy fantasies that would play throughout my mind, I was plagued by a seemingly never-ending stream of gruesome images. My parents put pressure on my psychiatrist to do something to relieve the symptoms, and so he prescribed Zoloft quite begrudgingly. Uh, but it didn't work. The obsessions continued to grow, and one day he sent me home telling my parents that I was cured. Uh, in October of 2002, I was so frustrated with how my OCD was being treated that I switched to a new psychiatrist. He evaluated me, confirmed that I did have OCD, and decided that while Zoloft was not effective, Prozac might be. Along with the Prozac, I was put into a weekly regimen of talk therapy. Instead of speaking to me abstractly about my obsessions, uh, his approach was to force me to confront them. When I was at home and attack set in, he would make me draw out whatever image was terrifying me. By facing it, I was taking away its power over me. I hated it. Most weeks, I didn't want to go to his office. I was scared to face the obsessions. I would much rather have pretended that they didn't exist rather than go through the agonizing procedure of seeing them again and again and again. There were innumerable times when I sat in his office saying, I can't do this. Don't make me do this. Not again. Um, this month, well, yeah, marks the 11th year that I have been seeing the same psychiatrist. I'm still on Prozac. I always will be. As I have grown, my dosage of Prozac has increased. I still participate in talk therapy with my psychiatrist, albeit once a month instead of once a week. This doesn't bother me anymore. Instead of being ashamed of my OCD, I'm proud because it has made me who I am. And though I will always have obsessions, I'm OK with that. Um, my life hasn't been easy. Throughout middle school and high school, my school administrators would refuse to acknowledge my OCD, despite having all of the proper documentation. Their responses ranged from, well, you don't need any help because you do fine in school, so you clearly don't have a problem, to, well, what is OCD anyway? I mean, can't you just get over it, you know, wash your hands once more? People have always judged me, both for having a mental disorder and for the way that I treat it. Most often, they tell me that it's not a real problem and the unnecessary medication is just poisoning my body. That is a quote. Uh, but I don't see it that way. Instead, it's, it's like the glasses that I wear. Naturally, my eyes don't function as well as they should. Um, so I use these glass lenses, which science has allowed us to create, to improve upon what I've been given. Megan, thank you. Dr. Schwartz, I'm going to ask you, as a practicing psychiatrist, how common is a story like Megan's and the fact that it did take so many years for a doctor to say, yes, she may be really young, but this is what she has? Well, it's all too common, but I have to start reacting by saying, Megan, congratulations. Thank you. I, I think you're coming forward and telling your story to everybody, the people here, the people who are watching is about the most important thing that you could do to advance um, the cause of people getting treatment. It, it is a, the biggest and boldest anti-stigma step that, that you could take. And if everybody else wants to participate in anti-stigma, go to stopthestigmact.com to sign a pledge in, in Hartford Hospital's anti-stigma campaign. So, I mean, that is, is the first thing, and, and um, you really deserve a lot of credit. Thank you. This speaks to uh, the paucity of services that are, are sometimes available. I want to guess that your family was commercially insured, that you were not in the system of the Department of Mental Health, and that yes. you relied on insurance. Yes. And, you know, it's often the case that, that people who rely on the, on the commercially insured segment of, of behavioral health care 
really have the hardest time accessing services um, because there are fewer services available and um, services are reimbursed so poorly. They're often, I think you said that there was one psychiatrist yes. available at the time that you, that you first started getting into treatment. This is, this is a major issue. So the whole insurance system is something that, that really needs to be addressed. Another point that this illustrates is that there's no one way to get treatment. Medications may work for some people. Psychotherapy works for some people. The combination of medication and psychotherapy for most severe disorders turns out to be the most effective way you know, to, get, to get treatment. And fortunately, you finally did, and you stuck with it. Yeah. You, you faced this terribly difficult course. That's, that's another point. The road to recovery is rocky and hard for so many people, but your story is a kind of, of a beacon of hope you. because you went down that road you know, you're still going down yes. that road, and, and you'll be going down that road uh, possibly. Um, you're facing it, and you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of myths about mental health uh, that are out there, and we thought we ought to try to bust a few of those tonight. Um, one of them is that children don't experience mental health problems. And the fact is that 50% of all mental health disorders appear before a person is 14. Three quarters of mental health disorders begin before age 24. So Jocelyn Mackey, um, I'm going to talk to you about schools. And in the environment that uh, Megan was in, um, that she was eight then, so that was um, more than 10 years ago, would things be any different today in terms of teachers and other people that are in the school system recognizing when a child has an issue? I would um, absolutely have to say yes. And that's because um, in our schools, uh, we have a couple of frameworks in place that really allow for um, early identification and early intervention uh, for students who are presenting with mental health concerns, um, and also creates an environment in which that stigma uh, is not as prominent, so that students feel much more comfortable with um, going to a trusted adult and actually sharing his or her concerns or experiences. Um, one such framework is SRBI, it's um, Scientific Research Based Interventions. And the way this is designed is that um, students are able to uh, be identified by um, educators, uh, mental health professionals in the schools um, who recognize that, that uh, assistance is needed, and they can receive interventions at three different levels. Um, the first level is universal and uh, is available to all students. The second um, focuses on uh, more targeted interventions. And the third is more intensive. And it sounds like the kinds of interventions that um, you would have benefited from, uh, Megan, would have been at that third tier level. Um, so that's one. And, and one of the uh, wonderful things about this framework is that it also allows for what's called progress monitoring. So that if the interventions were not effective, um, it's recognized immediately and uh, modifications are made. So that's, that's one. Um, another, I think, that would have been beneficial uh, for Megan would have been positive behavioral support strategies. And it's very similar to SRBI with the three-tiered process, uh, early recognition and interventions, and uh, making modifications um, as necessary. Mm -hmm. so, so those are two frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you said you were uh, eight, eight years of yes. age. Um, so uh, another intervention that would have been beneficial is the primary mental health program. Mm -hmm. And that's um, a program that's available to students pre-K to grade three on up to, uh, to uh, the sixth grade. And it's uh, really effective with students who present with anxious kinds of behaviors, mm -hmm. who are shy and withdrawn, um, who may be experiencing some school adjustment concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and it is evidence-based and research-based. Um, and it has been found to be uh, hugely beneficial to our, our younger students for over 30 years uh, in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So. Jocelyn, yeah. thank you. Um, Commissioner Reamer, uh, one of the things that uh, I think a lot of people tend to think is that mental illnesses do not affect me or my family. What's the truth of that? 
Well, I think the truth is that we know that at least one in five individuals in the United States suffer from some sort of uh, mental health issue or substance abuse issue, mm -hmm. and that probably everybody in this room, although as I look around, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir, but <laughs> out there I hope I'm not, um, knows somebody, has a family member, um, has a neighbor who has suffered with symptoms of some sort of mental health disorder. And I think that that's just the reality that we live in. Commissioner, I saw a detail on the national government's website, mentalhealth.org, I think it is, um, or .gov, saying that two out of three adults who are experiencing symptoms do not seek treatment because of their fear of not being able to get well or their fear of stigma that will be attached to them. Is that the case? I think very much so. I, I think that when people are feeling um, badly, the desire to get help or to believe that you can actually get better is often not there. Hope is one of the, we know hope is one of the most important factors in people's recovery. There's a lot of factors, not all clinical treatment, but hope is critical. And the stigma is, um, we see that every day. Uh, people who don't want to talk about it, that don't want to admit it to their wives, to their husbands, certainly to their neighbors. I know of an individual very well who had a diagnosis of um, schizophrenia, who went very public with it in this state. This is a while back. And um, after that occurred, his neighbors stopped speaking to him and stopped allowing their children to play with him, with his children. Prior to that, he'd been a part of a cul-de-sac kind of community. And um, that's pretty striking. Mm -hmm. uh, and you would have never known, and I think this is really important, if you looked at this individual, that they had any issues with any mental health or substance abuse issues. But once you disclose, some people, and I hope it's less and less, and I hope these community conversations are helping, mm -hmm. um, really are either afraid, they don't know what to say, they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing, or they just really don't want to believe that uh, it's there. Mm -hmm. So it, there's a variety of responses, some fear-based mm -hmm. and some just not comfortable talking about it. Commissioner, can you give for, for people, and as you said, in this room you may be preaching to the choir, but on our television audience we may be having uh, viewers who don't really know that much about what services are available and what happens in the state. Could you give us the 15-second elevator speech on what Demas does? Sure. Um, Demas provides a continuum of services to individuals, this is important, 18 and older, although we do have prevention that works in the school system on things like suicide and anti-smoking and underage drinking, but primarily 18 years and older. And the continuum um, goes from traditional outpatient therapy, seeing a therapist once a week, once a month, um, all the way up to inpatient hospitalization. But within that continuum, we have very, very intensive case management services, assertive community treatment programs, homeless outreach and engagement, um, things that I just want to um, also point out are not necessarily on, available on a continuum of people that are privately insured. And some of what we provide, frankly, we do believe very strongly are recovery-oriented supports like housing, vocational services, and those understandably perhaps are not covered by insurance, but are very important for people's recovery. We'll get into that in just a minute because we do have a deputy commissioner of the insurance department here, but I wanted to go to Mark Keenan, who's from the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Um, Mark, one of the things that Jocelyn said is that there are ways for young people to access services and not have the stigma attached to them. Now, while we're working on busting the stigma, um, one of the things that they can do if they happen to be lucky enough to be in a school with a, uh, a school-based health clinic is access services pretty anonymously. Yes, uh, that's one of the... Um one of the great advantages of the school-based health centers is that um, uh, once the, uh, the student kind of enters that portal, uh, there's such a full range of services at most of the school-based health centers uh, that it, they deliver primary care. Um, uh, some of them also deliver dental services. The student could, in fact, be going through that portal to access any of those. So it is somewhat anonymous um, to the other students. Uh, so you kind of avoid that kind of, uh, that kind of stigmatization. At the same time, um, they're really learning to manage their own, uh, 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 you know, their own care. Mm -hmm. 
you know, by, by accessing services early um, to, make it, uh, to make it, you know, uh, easy for them. That they really are, are being taught to, to, to manage their own, uh, their own condition. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for Elizabeth Canada, who's here. Elizabeth, where are you? There you are. Um, would you stand up for a minute, please, so I can reach you? Um, one of the things that um, was mentioned earlier, uh, and I think it was by Jocelyn, was um, trauma-based care uh, that's going on in schools, and that's becoming a model for Connecticut. What do we mean by that, Elizabeth? Well, we mean models that are informed by trauma of different sorts. Sometimes we think about trauma as the more severe types of, of incidents that maybe all of us would recognize, but also understanding that trauma can happen in different ways for different people. And so being um, aware of the impact of trauma and making sure that as a community we understand what that means and we have treatments that understand that and include methodologies that work to address symptoms of trauma and help children and, and adults with recovery. And I've had Well, I think that we, when we talk about trauma, we also want to talk about resiliency and so understanding that, yes, trauma can have lasting impact and we need to address that, but also understanding that there are many strengths that individuals can draw upon and resiliency that can help move forward. So that notion of hope is really a critical piece of the treatment and understanding that. Thank you. I see someone right behind you who's nodding, Penny Avalos. Penny, would you stand up, please, and come a little bit toward me, if you would? Um, Penny, tell us a little bit about um, what you do. You're a school social worker in the Griswold school system. Explain what that means. I'm a school social worker at the elementary school. Thanks. So I work with children in preschool through fourth grade. And um, I'm kind of, as I was nodding my head, I was a clinician in a previous position and worked with children that it had experienced trauma. So I'm just listening <laughs> and absolutely agreeing um, about resiliency and, and just treatment for kids that have, you know, experienced trauma. But um, the great thing about, we actually have a collaboration in our town, um, Three United Community and Family Services, which is a community mental health um, based clinic. So, you know, we work really closely. We see a lot of trauma in um, kids in our schools. So, you know, it's, it's great to have that kind of background and information. We, and we can make referrals to help kids, um, particularly with a, a model called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's very helpful. But definitely we're seeing a lot of trauma in young kids. Thank you. Um, Dr. Schwartz, I wanted to ask you about um, young people. We decided that for tonight's meeting we should really focus on young people 16 to 25 or so. And when I mentioned that to you, as well as to many other people who are here tonight, you said that's a very good idea. Why is that? Why is that age so vulnerable? Why do we need to focus on those kids? Well, there, there are so many reasons. Um, you know, one is just, you know, as um, we, were, we were just hearing, um, Issues that develop early in life that go untreated can affect the course of one's life uh, for many years to come. So looking at this from an economic financial point of view, um, from the point of view of, of um, uh, how to be most efficient in, in providing care, it makes the most sense. Looking at it from a humane point of view in terms of, of thinking what is most likely to relieve the most amount of suffering over lengthy periods of time, uh, it makes the most sense. Young people are still being formed. They're subject to so many influences. When faced with trauma and adversity, it's so much harder to stand up for themselves. And I, I think it's, it's our obligation um, to step in um, and provide as much help as we can. I want to say one other thing. You know, we're having in this discussion around the state and around the country a real focus on early detection and early intervention. And I think this dialogue that we're having is wonderful. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. But we do have to be sure that we really follow through. Because if we just identify and start down the road towards early intervention, but two or three or four years from now, move on to the next hot subject that is uh, occupying uh, all of our attention, we will have identified in the worst sense, that is, labeled kids who will be affected 
by these labels negatively if we don't really follow through with all of the treatment programs that, that we're talking about now. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. I, I think that's a, a really important point. Um, Daniel Prouty is uh, with us now. And Daniel, I watched you on TV today because you were testifying in front of the Task Force on Behavioral Health Services for Young People. Um, tell us uh, just a little short thumbnail of your own personal story. Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in Wethersfield um, from a young age, struggled with uh, behavioral health thing, problems, mental health. Um, and I uh, got into uh, alcohol and drugs at a young age. And uh, it, uh, I was talking today about, um, I liked how you meant, was mentioned earlier about uh, payment methods and uh, payment options and how there needs to be changes made because uh, especially with insurance, private insurance, um, I was sent out of state to a program and uh, was sent back after 15 days and uh, ended up relapsing. And... Uh, Luckily, I was able to get into DCF Voluntary Services, and they allowed me to go back up there and get the treatment I needed, which uh, I was saying earlier today, probably the only reason why I'm still here today. So uh, I feel like there's a lot of things that need to be looked at um, if we're going to benefit the, not only young adults, but every, anyone seeking treatment for uh, mental health and addiction problems. Daniel, thank you. Um, we've mentioned uh, insurance a couple of times, so um, Commissioner Dowling, I want to ask you to, uh, to stand up and, and talk to us a little bit. Um, we've heard about um, services that are uh, within Pat Reamer's area that are provided. Uh, we've heard Hank Schwartz say that in some cases there has been a problem with uh, commercial insurance. We just heard Daniel talking about that. Um, you have recently come out with a report, and you have also recently released uh, what the governor is calling a toolkit for mental health. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. One of the things we do every year is a report card that asks each one of the mental health and behavioral health and health care providers to tell us um, about its experience with claims. So what have you denied? What have you agreed to? And so forth. And we started noticing in the last year or so that there was a growing number of denied claims for mental health care, and particularly for young adults in residential treatment centers, and that alarmed us quite a bit. So we spent the last year or so going around to all of the carriers and asking them, what do you cover? What do you need to uh, make payments and so forth? And it was very, very interesting because what we found was that the state is somewhat split in terms of there are a lot of behavioral health providers who are not in insurance company networks. They do not want to be. It's not as if they can't be. They don't want to be for a lot of financial reasons, a lot of freedom reasons, and so forth. So they're not being paid for by a number of the insurance companies or being reimbursed because they're not in the network. So we have an issue there with the workforce that we're working with, and we also want people to make sure they look at their plans. So we found that people were taking their children at the most desperate moments and young adults to a number of these treatment centers, residential treatment centers, without talking to their insurance carriers because they were in such stress and trauma, they would just drive right up there and then go for reimbursement later. What we've discovered is that had they had the ability to call the provider and have a medical professional talk ahead of time, that almost all of the time they are covered. So what we did was put together a toolkit. We said, and we, we know that there is some possibility that you're in so much stress during this time that you're not going to be thinking to be calling your insurance company or your provider. But if you can at least think to call a medical professional of some kind on your way, and we put together a toolkit that said, this is what your insurance company needs before you'll have this paid for or reimbursed. And we tried to put it in the simplest terms that a family in distress could work with, and, and that's a start. There's a lot more work, and Commissioner Reamer and I are now have agreed to kind of catalog what's covered by the state, what's covered by insurance companies, and see where the gaps are and see what we can do. I think I heard you at, um, Commissioner, at a recent, thank you, um, I think I heard you at a recent meeting talking about creating a list. Here are all the services that the state provides under DEMIS or under DCF and then find out from uh, Commissioner Dowling what are all the services that, and then see if there's some coordination that can take place. Right. We actually have completed that. And then I think we're also looking at compiling, there may be things that nobody's paying for mm -hmm. that we think could be helpful. So for that task force report, we're putting in both a list of things that are paid for 
and uh, by the state or by um, private insurance, and then what's missing from that continuum. Mm -hmm. Because really, I, I would agree with Dr. Schwartz, if we don't get to individuals, um, certainly before 16, but what, between 16 and 25, we're looking at a much longer trajectory of treatment needs. And that is an expense to all of us. Um, and to the person, by the way, um, probably the most to the person. And so I think getting in as early as we can and providing individuals in that age range, age range the services they want, which is really critical, engaging individuals between 18 and 25 is not easy. And any of us that have kids that age know that. Um, but there are ways to do it. And, and outreach and engagement is a critical component of what we have to do. Um, and again, these kinds of community conversations, I think, lead to the possibility that somebody might reach out to us or to a friend or to a family member. But the ability to engage that population is really, it's incumbent on us to try and do that as much as we can. Dr. Schwartz, you mentioned something to me that um, a number of other uh, healthcare providers mentioned in the course of preparing for this program, and that was the stumbling block, if I can call it that, of the term that's used by insurers called medical necessity. And my understanding is that it's less clear in behavioral and emotional and psychological health what exactly medical necessity is. Whereas if I come into the emergency room and I have an inflamed kidney, it's, uh, excuse me, an inflamed gallbladder, let's say. It's pretty clear that a doctor is going to say the gallbladder has to come out, the insurance company is going to agree with that. That is the accepted method of treatment for that kind of a physical illness. Whereas the medical necessity category for behavioral health, emotional health, psychological health, um, allows more, should we say, discussion? <laughs> discussion is kind. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's, um, it's terrific that the insurance department and the Department of Mental Health have come together to, to look at, at the problem and to try to educate the public about how to access their insurance. But I don't really think that ignorance about how to access insurance is the central issue here, at least not in my experience and in the experience, I think, of most providers of care. Um, this matter of medical necessity reaches to the denial of care that uh, we face on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's all very well and good to say that if you know how to access your care, then it, it turns out that these, cares are, these, these treatments are actually covered. They may be covered, but then in each and every individual instance, an insurer has to approve care through this medical necessity uh, standard, which of course in around mental health issues is going to be um, nuanced, complex, um, and sometimes uh, ambiguous. Um, how depressed do you have to be for an issue to be one that reaches to medical necessity? And I'll, and I'll put it, it, paint it in an, in an even starker picture. How suicidal do you have to be? And I'm telling you this because we might have, let's, let's take the Institute of Loving where I employ five full-time master's prepared nurses to deal with this issue, just getting care approved by insurance companies for only 121 beds. I mean, that is a starkly expensive um, enterprise. Somebody may get approved um, to come in, pre-certified we call it, uh, with um, suicidal ideation every three days, probably at maximum three days, sometimes sooner, we have to have that, that stay approved again. Now, by day three or day four, the patient may say, well, I'm not really thinking I'm suicidal today. And further hospitalization could be denied on the basis of such a statement. Now, the providers of care know oh, suicidal ideation. It fluctuates. It goes up and down. This 16-year-old who we've hospitalized for suicidal ideation may just have decided they've got to get out of the hospital. They've got something going on outside, and the way to get out of the hospital is to say, I'm not suicidal anymore. And that crude kind of determinant may, may drive a decision that further care in the hospital is not medically necessary. So we've got to do something about this issue. Now, um, you know, federal regulations for the Federal Parity Act were finally um, issued um, 
in their completion just a few weeks ago, or a month ago or so. Or so. Um, and um, I'm hopeful that um, they will address this issue. They require kind of standardization of, of the, the guidelines for arriving at medical necessity determinations that insurance companies use. But no matter how much you standardize, uh, there's still a subjective judgment. Uh, I actually would totally reverse the situation. And I would require, if I had my way, insurers to prove that medical necessity is not present when somebody in extremis presents to a psychiatric emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Kate Matthias here, who's from, Kate, what can I have you stand up, um, who is uh, with an organization that advocates on behalf of people uh, with mental illness, uh, NAMI. And I saw you nodding quite a bit during that <laughs> conversation. Um, and I wanted to see if you would explain something to people who haven't dealt with this yet. Uh, the term was brought up, parity. Um, we're talking tonight about trying to get mental health thought of in the same way as physical health. That's something that um, Nelva Marquez Green brought up early on in the conversation. Um, what does the term parity mean and how does it relate to those two things? Well, actually, I think in the context in which it's being talked about this evening, it really means for the insurance side, it means that mental health um, situations are dealt with in the same way as a physical illness might be dealt with in terms of if there are no limitations on how many cancer treatments you can receive because you're getting chemotherapy, there shouldn't be any um, stipulations as to how many visits you can have with your psychiatrist if you're having psychiatric difficulties. So that's sort of, in the crudest way to sort of talk about what Dr. Schwartz said, is really sort of what's meant by parity. And I think also, I think broadly speaking, if you talk about parity and mental illness, I think you're talking about it being thought of as like any other chronic illness, mm -hmm. that it is treatable, that people recover from it, that they live with it, that they manage it. I think there's that concept in terms of thinking about mental illness that when you think about parity, you think about it in the same way as you do other illnesses. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Kevin Sullivan, who is now the Commissioner of Revenue Services, but uh, is a former Lieutenant Governor and uh, Senator. Um, Connecticut has had a law on parity much longer than the federal government. The federal government is relatively new, uh, 2008, I think, and they're just getting around to promulgating regulations now. Connecticut took this step quite some time ago when you were still in the legislature. Tell us about that. We did, and uh, unfortunately, there's only a limit to what a state can do, which is why the federal government had to take this next step. Uh, we cannot reach the vast majority of health insurance programs that are preempted from state regulation and must be done at the federal level. Uh, it, it was an effort that took the voices and the faces and the messages and the stories of people with mental illnesses uh, to convince folks in the legislature uh, that, and frankly, to convince folks in the insurer community that it was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing to do. I'm glad we were a leader. I'm so grateful that the federal government has caught up. And I can just say that, you know, behind it all is one simple message, I think, and that is that people with mental illnesses are people first who just happen to have an illness. There are people with all kinds of illnesses. And when we begin to think differently about that, that's where parity makes sense. We are all in need of health care. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I want to talk to a couple of the parents now. Um, Ann Nelson, where are you? Here you are. Step out over here and tell me just, uh, give me the sort of elevator speech, a 30-second speech about um, your efforts with your kids. Well, um, I have two children. Um, one is 20 and one is 18 in one week, so I want to let her know that I said that. Um, and um, my older daughter has been, um, had a mental health diagnosis since the age of seven. And um, I believe in collaboration as I'm looking at the insurance commissioner. However, the road of obtaining private insurance when Emmy was seven, eight, nine was exhaustive. And I'm a nurse and my ex-husband is a physician, and we knew the details. Yet every area we went, we were told she can only stay 24 hours. That's not medically necessary. And again, I'll do anything to better understand how to play the game, but we thought we knew, and yet um, we couldn't get services. So it just, it just breaks my heart that if educated folks who are nurses and a doctor can't get it, then who can? 
Um, so I've really rallied to really fight the private insurance fight, and, and again, in a collaborative model. How are your kids doing now, besides one of them turning 18? Uh, that's scary. I'm not doing well. Um, <laughs> you know what? Just like anyone said, it is recovery, and hope is the message, and connectedness is the message. And so it's just, it is love. And it's just fighting for those you love and releasing them. That's the thing I'm trying to do now, is release the kids to do their own fighting. And I think I have a black belt in codependence, so someone might be on. <laughs> It's complicated, too, doesn't it? I'm going to ask uh, Lorna to join us. Uh, Lorna, if you'd stand up, just give us, again, the kind of thumbnail of uh, your family situation. Oh, sure. Um, let's say I have two children also. Um, 26 and 27 years old. Um, Stefan came home from Guatemala when he was seven months old. Um, he's our 27-year-old. Um, early, early on, we knew that there was something up. And um, it was very difficult trying to find services. It was very frustrating finding services. Um, and I realized that if, if I, as a person who... Um, can access services, and my, my background was library science, and I can, you know, research. I can't imagine, if I had a hard time, how others were going through it. Um, Stefan, eventually, uh, we went through systems of care, voluntary services twice, um, and then into residential treatment. Um, uh, ended up going from DCF to DMS, um, and is a graduate of, of Young Adult Services, thank you, God, and um, is now doing rather well. He's 27 years old, and he's a volunteer firefighter. And so, yeah, so there's hope. There's definitely hope. Lorna, thank you very much. I'm going to um, let our panel switch now, because we said we would switch at the half hour point. We've gone much further. Um, if you folks would step over to the side, we have another panel coming up, and we'll have our staff uh, switch over the microphones. In the meanwhile, I want to have a few folks step out from this row right here. If you'll all join Sorry. me, Catherine and Val and Jamie and Richard, come on out. Um, I want to talk about, and I think we'll turn this way so that we don't get uh, in trouble with the... We mentioned how this is a national conversation. And uh, really, Catherine, you are kind of one of the people who's assigned to carry that out nationwide uh, with your organization, SAMHSA. Tell us a little bit about what SAMHSA is and how the conversation is rolling out nationwide. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We are one of the operating divisions under the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. And as an agency designated specifically with our name mm -hmm. to talk about these conditions, we are part of the building awareness, building education, and moving out the messages and the programs and the grants mm -hmm. that help support services. I think when the president took this on, uh, we were delighted to be able to say, now we can begin to talk about these conditions conditions as health conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think that coupled with the parity and equity law and the Affordable Care Act are bringing us to another level of understanding and awareness. And so uh, across the United States, all of the publicly funded mental health and substance abuse service systems have been developing separately for centuries, mm -hmm. separately for centuries. Mm -hmm. Now we're at a point where we have the opportunity to incorporate and inculcate behavioral health services, mental health substance abuse into the public health system. That is going to be an important shift for many, many states, particularly Connecticut, that has a long-term experienced uh, history with publicly funded services, and now that's going to change. So SAMHSA's role is to assist the commissioners and to assist uh, state leadership in not only obtaining technical assistance, training, and grants mm -hmm. for using those services, but also we're pushing out the message that behavioral health is essential to health, mental health is overall fundamental to well-being, we know that recovery is possible, we know that prevention works, and we know that treatment is effective. And so bringing those messages to the public dialogue and reinforcing those messages really brings us to this notion about mental health is a civic issue. I was a, te I was a teacher in elementary school and high school, and I used to think, you know, my job is to really make sure that these children and youth grow emotionally. Mm -hmm. Whether they ever got algebra was just a side effect. <laughs> And, and so, so for me, the notion that we're moving the discussion about emotional health mm -hmm. and what good mental health means into a dialogue across all the sectors means that we're therefore focused on talking about what we mean by good mental health. We have a continuum here. There are problems, there are disorders, there are illnesses. But we have never taught children how to talk about their emotional health or how to talk about 
what good mental health is. That's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And SAMHSA is there to ready to stand with the commissioners and the governor and all of the people in Connecticut because you are leading the way, and we're very excited about what Connecticut is doing. Well, thank you for coming from Boston. I understand there was also some money for some school districts in Connecticut. That's correct. Actually, Connecticut has a very good track record of obtaining SAMHSA grants for specific programs, specifically in suicide prevention, specifically in safe schools, healthy students. Mm -hmm. And there were many grant programs, actually, that grew out prior to 1214 that came from school incidents. Mm -hmm. And so Connecticut has really been successful in obtaining specific grants to be able to create a safer school environment, mm -hmm. not just looking at negative and reducing negative behaviors mm -hmm. like bullying, but also looking at how do you improve the climate and the culture through the adaptation of classroom behavior management like the good behavior game. And so Connecticut is really, again, showing us with through those grants how we can do really effective programming. And Connecticut is also leading the way in terms of looking at how to integrate primary care and behavioral health care, which I think is hugely important mm -hmm. because many of the young people you're talking about, um, young children and youth, may go to a pediatrician mm -hmm. but may or may not ever see a behavioral health mm -hmm. specialist. So the fact that we're moving towards integration of primary care and behavioral health care and Connecticut is leading the way again with some of the provider agencies is really a, a wonderful opportunity. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more during this conversation about how uh, primary care physicians and pediatricians can access uh, help uh, from psychiatrists and psychologists, so um, that's a program that's already ongoing. Um, Richard Frieder from the Hartford Public Library, I'm going to hand you the microphone. I want you to tell us a little bit about what the Hartford Public Library did as its share in this national conversation. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Diane. Um, in mid-November, we had an event at the Hartford Public Library. It was, it was a Saturday, uh, pretty much a full-day event. We invited people to come in. Uh, our goal was to get a very diverse group of people because we have found that with community dialogue work, the more diversity, the better the process works. And we actually got about 120 people, and it was an extremely diverse group, um, uh, both in, in terms of economic status, geographic um, residents, residents of Hartford and many other towns, uh, educational levels. Uh, we had many people who have experienced mental health issues themselves uh, or um, their family members or friends. We had service providers in the room. So it was a very diverse group, and we asked them to do a few things. One was to uh, sit down together in groups of eight or ten and tell each other their stories. And we've seen tonight here the power of storytelling. Um, uh, so that, that got everybody's juices flowing. We then asked them to talk together again in groups of eight or ten about what are the issues uh, of mental health in Connecticut. And then we asked them to uh, talk about um, what are some ideas for taking action that may uh, improve some of these issues. Uh, and the outgrowth of that was that four action teams were formed. By the way, many of the issues that they came up are, are the same issues we're hearing about here tonight, access to services, stigma, misperceptions, the impact of mental health on youth, et cetera. Um, so four action teams were formed. That was about all we could do in one day. So uh, those action teams are now meeting and working towards action. Uh, so our goal was um, to not only provide people with an opportunity to talk, but with an opportunity to take action. We're, the action teams are committed to not reinventing the wheel. We're very much aware of all the great things that are already happening. We want to build on those things. So um, that was the event that we had in November. We'll be following up. We'll be bringing the action teams together in, uh, in a few months to, to see how everybody's doing. Richard, thank you. Thank you. So much. And Jamie Daniel is here from the Connecticut Forum. You have a special event coming up in March, I think. We do. Thank you. Um, yes, on Friday, March 7th, the Connecticut Forum is presenting an honest look at mental illness, which will be a live unscripted panel conversation about many of these same topics that we're talking about here tonight. And I think what makes it particularly important is that it's a large-scale public conversation, unlike uh, the size that you normally see for things like this. So we expect 2,800 people at the Bushnell Theater in Hartford. And we have a renowned panel of both experts and people who bring um, lived experience with a mental illness, um, including Dr. Hank Schwartz, who's here tonight, um, the writer Andrew Solomon, who talks about his own depression, 
We have Royce White, who is a former um, NBA and college basketball star who is now speaking out about his anxiety. And then we have um, Kay Redfield Jameson, who's a foremost authority on um, bipolar disorder and also speaks about her own lived experience with that disorder. And we've just been struck, like everyone is saying here tonight, with the stigma that surrounds this topic. Um, we know that mental illness should be talked about like other illnesses, and our hope is that by having a large-scale public forum like this, we can try to at least start to arrive at a reality where people talk about it, just like they talk about breast cancer, just like they talk about diabetes, just like we talk about other health issues. So um, I hope that you all will consider joining us for that evening, um, and it's Friday, March 7th at the Bushnell. And uh, Val Ramos is uh, a partner that uh, Denise Merrill, the Secretary of State, mentioned um, with Everyday Democracy, that you have gotten us involved in a number of important conversations about civic health. And what will Everyday Democracy be doing in the spring now? Well, we're very fortunate to have collaborated, first of all, with the Hartford Public Library in the dialogues. They were absolutely excellent. Um, and we're also very fortunate that we worked with SAMHSA and with the White House since the launch of the National um, Dialogue on Mental Health in June. And what we've done is we've gone to work with two of the lead sites that are part of the national initiative in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and also in Columbus, Ohio. The mayors and the community and civic leaders in those two cities have really already started to launch uh, really a, a whole array of community dialogues, and they're working on creating action plans that will address the whole idea of expanding services for young adults in their states. And there are other sites that are part of the initiative that are doing the same thing. Um, Everyday Democracy is committed to that work, and we've done it nationally for many years. And we are, we're going to be working with a group of potential partners here in the state to provide support to community groups that want to do dialogues uh, in their communities. And um, there is information available, and folks can go to the creatingcommunitysolutions.org website and also call our office at 860-727-5917, and we'll be glad to give them information on how they can connect with these dialogues uh, taking place in different communities. Thank you so much, Val. I'll let you all take your seats back, but I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that we are dialed in with a network of conversations. I'd like to introduce our next panel now, and thank you for standing by and waiting. Uh, to my left is Louise Pyers, who is the executive director of Cable. We'll explain uh, what that means. It's not Cable TV. It's uh, something much more interesting. Dr. Stephen Larson from the Rushford Center and the Natchog Hospital. Uh, and then Dante Bartolomeo, who is a state senator of uh, who had a, a very interesting uh, first session as a state senator and a very accomplished session, and Luis Perez, who is the CEO of the Mental Health Association of Connecticut. And actually, Luis, I am going to start with you because one thing that we haven't mentioned tonight is that um, when we talk about Connecticut taking a lead, I think that is most appropriate because Connecticut really was the home of a man that many people have said was the father of the mental health movement, a man by the name of Clifford Beers, who was born in New Haven and who suffered um, terribly and really came out of his recovery to try and help other people with mental illness. Can you tell us a little about how he inspired your organization? Sure. Um, it's interesting because I seem to be uh, following the spirit of Clifford Beers. Uh, in my previous position at uh, Connecticut Valley Hospital as the CEO there, uh, we had Beers uh, Hall, uh, which is named after Clifford, and, and now uh, I'm working for the Mental Health Association of Connecticut, which was founded by uh, Clifford Beers in, in 1908 as the Connecticut Society for Mental Hygiene. Um, if we seem to have cleaned up our act a little bit, but it doesn't <laughs> seem like um, we have really reached the level um, that uh, Clifford was really aspiring to. Uh, we still have stigma, just like he uh, faced in 1908. Uh, we still have uh, issues with uh, access to services. Uh, we still have uh, uh, perhaps some uh, practitioners out there that are not up uh, on the latest uh, technology in terms of knowledge and, and, and research uh, and, and providing services um, to people like Megan mm -hmm. uh, in terms of being uh, uh, effective in, in their treatment. So uh, we continue to uh, follow the uh, 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 vision that uh, Clifford had, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to, in the future, continue to uh, strive for reaching that uh, ideal. 
Thank you. Um, I want to talk to uh, State Senator Dante Bartolomeo now. Uh, you certainly had a uh, rather interesting first term as a state senator, and because of what happened, um, you had an opportunity to work on an issue that was extremely important to you. Um, you crafted a very important mental health bill. Let me just have you give the real thumbnail of what that bill calls for. Sure. Um, I, the bill is um, an act concerning the mental, emotional, and behavioral health of children. And at the same time that we were crafting that bill, we had just finished passing what was the gun violence prevention and school safety bill. Um, in that particular first bill, there is, in the mental health section, a focus on um, 16 to 25. Mm -hmm. What we are very aware of and conscious of was to make sure that we also completed the session with a focus on um, birth on up. And so um, I collaborated with the authors of the first bill, and um, this makes us in Connecticut look at mental health in a way that we haven't done before when we have our individual agencies and our individual siloed um, programs. So we now are making sure that there is a framework by which our programs have to kind of pass through, if you will. And that means that they have to make sure that there's an emphasis on prevention and early identification and early intervention. They have to be sensitive to diversity and reflect that. Um, there has to be a continuum of care, and it has to, so most importantly, be family focused. Um, I like to refer to it, and I, I'm stealing this from a friend of mine, um, Elaine Zimmerman, with the Commission on Children, um, but I refer to it as a braided system. We're creating a braided system so that if you envision the family as the braid in the center and you, you know, wrap your services over, under, back, forth, and around the family, they're all coming back to the center. And at times, those services might be on the outside and indirect, and at other times, they're directly on the family. But the important thing is that they focus on the family um, and that they are trauma informed Formed and evidence-based and, and all of that. So that's my quickest, but I, I can keep going if you'd like. <laughs> Senator, and I'll give you a chance to do that, but um, I'd like you to tell the story, if you don't mind, about what really inspired you to get involved with this, and that was your own family, your own sister. I'm happy to, and especially following Megan, who was so brave. Um, so my sister was adopted when she was three and a half years old, and prior to her adoption endured multiple types of traumas in the DCF system. She's now 39, so it was quite some time ago. Um, but when, when, her, when she first came to live with us in those first six months before the placement was finalized, my parents remember maybe two phone calls, if that. And then after that, there was no such thing as wraparound services, absolutely positively no support. Uh, moving forward at age 14, um, she and Let me stop you just for a minute because I don't think you explained what her issues were. Um, well, it, she had experienced all kinds of traumas, um, but at 14 presented a variety of symptoms, which later on when she was in, um, in crisis, I suppose, and in her most... Um, challenged time, she did receive a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Now, there have been other diagnoses and, um, you know, time come and gone, um, but that was, if anybody in the room who's a treater knows that most people kind of gasp um, and was very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so because of that, from 14 until six. For 16 years, until she was 30, she was in and out of hospitals and programs um, in four different states, as far as we went with Chicago. Um, but I do have to say, it's been mentioned before, my parents are well-educated and um, very supportive family structure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's amazing. They had to, in this situation, do all of the research to figure out what's going on with her and therefore where to go. They had to keep all of the records. They had to be the liaisons between facilities and doctors. And um, they were going through a crisis of their own, not to mention the sure. fact that those of us at home were in crisis. So it's really important to me that we remember that when you have a child in crisis, you have a family in crisis, mm -hmm. and we need to find a way to treat that whole family and therefore that braided system that's working around them. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for that. Diane, I'm sorry. Can I just mention, though, before sure. I leave with that, it's a good story in the end yeah. because at 39, she's living independently and working in retail, and she's going to community college. Um, but, you know, it's important I say that. It's, she's got amazing strength, but it was a long road. Well, I think it's wonderful to um, reinforce what we've been saying tonight, which is that recovery is possible and there is hope. And I'm so happy to hear that she's doing that well. Leave you with that. Um, <laughs> it's really a wonderful story, and thank you um, for sharing that story with us. Um, Dr. Larson, um, is that, 
are those situations any better now? Um, Dante described to me over the telephone that her parents, who were well-educated people who had to surge out these services, said, I think her mother said at one point, it's like being dropped in a foreign country where you don't speak the language and you don't know the customs. Is it any different today from when her sister was a little girl? I think we have more supports today. But, you know, I'm really struck by the moms mostly, but the, the family members that have become the advocates for their kids and have to negotiate an incredibly complex system that is almost designed not to make it happen. Uh, you know, is it better? Maybe, but it's not nearly what it needs to be. And I think that the promise of trying to create a braid to really try to pr deliver on the promise of integrated care uh, is the challenge that we as providers have to own. Managed care is not going to do this for us. I think we've learned that managed care is not going to integrate the services. It's ultimately going to be the consumers and the providers that find a way to come together and provide that kind of coordinated care that I think everyone wants to have. So everyone doesn't have to have internet skills, uh, legal skills, nursing skills, uh, to get the care that they need for their family. So uh, is it better? I would say there's more supports today than there were then, but we still have a very fragmented system, uh, and it's still a, quite a challenge. And we're lucky that the family members have the passion uh, that we heard tonight. One of the things that we haven't talked about yet is how many people, um, young people in particular in the 16 to 25 range that we're talking about, end up in um, juvenile justice system or in the correction system because they were not treated for the problems that they had, the mental health issues, the substance abuse, and so instead they end up in the mental health uh, in the correction system instead of in the mental health system. In fact, I read on, I believe it was on your site, Louise, um, from a police officer and a corrections officer who said that we may, meaning corrections, may provide more mental health care than any other single organization in the state of Connecticut, which is kind of frightening that that's where people end up. Um, Louise, tell us a little bit about your group, CABLE. Um, Cable stands for the Connecticut Alliance to Benefit Law Enforcement. We are often mistaken for cable companies. We get <laughs> phone calls every once in a while. Um, but it was an organization that was started back um, in 1999 as a result of a tragedy that happened to one of my family members. Mm -hmm. And it involved a, uh, a misdiagnosis, number one, of, of my family member, and then an inappropriate but again, it's not the doctor's fault. The medications were, were doubled without having that proper diagnosis, and then he shot up to a manic state and then um, tried to commit suicide by engaging a police officer to shoot him because he didn't have, the, uh, he didn't have a gun or any other means. And he was, he was almost successful. Um, he encountered a police officer who uh, did try to get him to slow down and calm down, and nothing was working. And so he started to approach the officer with a bottle, and as the, the officer was backing up into the road, um, he had to shoot him. And um, as a result of that, thank God, number one, that this family member lived, number one. Mm -hmm. That's the most important piece. Uh, but number two, it really opened up a, a dialogue between law enforcement, mental health, and families that was never there before. And it was thanks to law enforcement people who were very, very in tune, astute, and were open to hearing uh, the story and how we could work together to problem solve and hopefully make incidents like that less likely, mm -hmm. although acknowledging that sometimes they still will happen. Mm -hmm. But what kinds of information do police officers need that would be helpful to them in dealing with people with mental illness describing, I mean, to, to de-escalate the situation and perhaps link them to services instead of making an arrest. Mm -hmm. So that's how Cable was born, um, out of connection with Lieutenant Kenneth, Kenneth Edwards from the New London Police Department. Uh, and he had started the crisis intervention team program in his department. And so he shared that with Cable. Mm -hmm. And together, we worked together to uh, seek funding to have a statewide CIT training program. 
I want to um, ask uh, Lieutenant Sean Grant to stand up here from the Manchester Police Department. Um, I believe that uh, you run the CIT program um, in your department. Um, tell us how this kind of training makes a difference in how an officer approaches a situation. Well, currently we have about a third of our police department uh, sworn officers who are trained uh, in CIT. I've been so for the last four years. Um, often when I would respond to calls as a newer officer, uh, we would respond to breach of peace, domestic violence, uh, routine assaults. And when we would get there, um, we would assume sometimes uh, incorrectly that the individual was having a bad day and were acting out and they were having issues uh, due to the alcoholism or um, inappropriate behavior. Uh, what we now know, what we've learned since then, is that there are people that have legitimate mental illness mm -hmm. concerns that are mis, uh, misrepresented in other forms. Uh, we've become enlightened on those forms through CIT and through cable. Uh, and now we have staff uh, through our dispatchers, through our detectives, our officers, our supervisors, being trained are now approaching things differently, taking things slower, mm -hmm. relaxing when we approach things, doing things such as turning off the lights when we approach an individual who we're aware of that has those issues mm -hmm. or is having uh, some kind of um, mental illness or mental concerns. Uh, things like that we're able to put into our computer system to let us know before we get there um, that we may need to take some things into, into account before we arrive and before we handle that call. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the the fluidity of dealing with the same people on the same, uh, on the same areas and the same concerns, uh, we, we begin to get some intel and we have regular meetings and we get suggestions on how to handle those issues uh, through mental health uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. So we've taken a, a larger approach at dealing with the issue. We have uh, Manchester Hospital in town, mm -hmm. other uh, services in town that, that uh, provide us with uh, this, this group um, that enable us to have this training, give us this training. Uh, we utilize that when we're on the force and when we're in the streets. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we also have something in the state now called um, emergency mental health first aid uh, training. In fact, the legislature is offering it, I believe, at the end of next week. Um, is there anyone here who's gone through the first aid training? Judy, would you like to tell us a little bit about what that is? I mean, we all know what first aid is for physical health. How about for mental health? Okay, thank you, Diane. I've not only gone through the training, but I've been training it as a facilitator for about four years. So it's a training for the community at large. It's for all members of the community, and it has several goals. One is to just teach people about mental health challenges. What are the signs? What are the symptoms? What kinds of things could people be looking for? It dispels myths, and it reduces stigma. It gives a strong recovery message as well. Um, how do people uh, give hope to someone who might be having a, a mental health challenge? And finally, it gives a very practical five-step plan for helping somebody who might be either developing a mental health challenge or having a mental health crisis. And we know that we hear very frequently that people want to do something, but they don't know what to do or they're afraid that they might make things worse. So this is very practical, and we do believe that it can transform communities you know, and the whole state. Um, years ago, I took CPR. If someone's going to take CPR, shouldn't they take this too? Absolutely, 100%, yes. What That's the goal. What does it involve? It's an eight-hour training, mm -hmm. yep, usually over two days. Mm -hmm. And it's very interactive, um, very well-respected, evidence-based, very popular. If people want to sign up for that training, is there a place they can go to uh, learn where the uh, courses are going to be held in their area? Sure. They can call me at um, Connecticut Clearinghouse, the program of Wheeler Clinic, Great. and the number is 800-232-4424. Thank, Thank you so much, Judy. I appreciate that. Um, I actually did talk to a few people uh, while we were getting ready for this meeting and told them about the first aid training, and they said, gee, I'd like to know more about that. I haven't taken it, but I'd like to know more about that. Um, one of the groups that we haven't really talked about that falls into this age category um, are returning veterans, and we probably all have heard the stories of how many returning veterans are coming home with the um, unseen wounds of war, and this is one of the things that um, the Mental Health Initiative is really intended to embrace. Race. And um, Jason DeVivo is with us. And uh, you work with vets at the VA hospital? Yes, I do, yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing, uh, what you're seeing with the people that are coming home from recent deployments. 
Well, we're seeing a variety of concerns coming home. Um, and I think one thing we forget is that any veteran who has served in the military, um, whether they've been deployed or not, faces a number of difficulties just readjusting to the civilian world. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly our younger veterans will report at the same time, they'll, when they get back here, they'll feel sort of ahead of their peers. They've had all these amazing experiences. Mm -hmm. They'll also feel behind their peers. So they may be starting college and the friends from high school are already finished. Mm -hmm. um, so regardless of where one has been deployed or what one has seen, those readjustment concerns are always there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we've, we've been at war for over a decade now. So we're seeing folks who have had a number of different, very difficult experiences overseas. And uh, coming home, we're really trying to work with um, getting access as open as possible. Mm -hmm. And we face as much stigma uh, as, as, as we've heard from, from all the speakers here. We're also dealing with a population that in the military learns uh, to persevere to never stop, mm -hmm. to never give up. Mm -hmm. And for that population to slow down and say, well, I can't handle this, I need help, is extremely difficult. So we do our best to normalize the experiences veterans have, to destigmatize the concerns, and to try and open our doors. And we've, uh, this is also a, a time of unprecedented cooperation uh, between VA and the Department of Defense, also between VA and a lot of state uh, and local agencies. So we're, we're really trying to get veterans care wherever they're comfortable doing so. We've heard uh, over the years about how many veterans were reluctant to seek care. And we've also heard from the top military brass that they're trying to change that whole culture. Have you seen any real evidence of that, Jason? Oh, we have, yeah. Uh, there's a VA presence, uh, I, I know specifically with our local National Guard, uh, when soldiers come back, there's a VA presence when they come back, uh, their first post-mobilization event. Uh, I usually give uh, outreach talks along with my colleagues at the 60-day uh, post-mobilization event. So we try and be an active presence uh, whenever veterans come together. Uh, and again, the goal is destigmatizing. Uh, there are embedded uh, healthcare providers uh, in all of our National Guard units. So we're really trying to make veterans aware that um, Difficulties happen a lot, readjustment is hard, and there are resources there, and we're ready to help. All right, thank you so much. Um, speaking of stigma, we've had a lot of people um, in this audience who have experienced the stigma of either having a mental health problem or having a family member with one. Um, Kathleen, would you mind standing up? I wanted to have you uh, tell a little bit about your story. Um, you are an attorney. Uh, but getting into the Connecticut bar was a little bit of a trick for you. I won't say trick in the, in the bad sense, but it, it took a bit of effort. To explain why. Well, I don't think it's a problem that I have bipolar disorder, but apparently the Connecticut Bar Examining Committee had a bit of an issue with that. Um, long story short, um, I graduated from Harvard Law School, but my first year at Harvard Law School, I was civilly committed to McLean Hospital. Um, I spent 60 days there, um, did return the following year, and graduated with the class that had started under me, um, but had two voluntary trips to the hospital my, when I returned to law school. Um, and the Connecticut Bar Examining Committee asked questions about your mental health treatment when you apply for admission to the bar. The time I applied to the Connecticut Bar, I was already admitted in Massachusetts and New York, um, but um, they do things differently in Connecticut. That's what I was told. It took me a year and a half from the time I passed the bar to get admitted in Connecticut. When I finally got admitted, the judge told me in his chambers he was glad they have a conditional admissions procedure because Otherwise, they used to not let people like me into the bar. So I said, thank you, Your Honor, and then uh, got to go out into the courtroom where all the friends from my office were waiting for me. Um, and the thing that was great was my uncle got to admit me, give me the oath to swear me into the bar. Um, but then I got to listen to the judge give me the speech about how wonderful it was to be admitted to practice the bar mm. in Connecticut. Um, so I love being a legal aid lawyer. Um, I love being a member of the Connecticut Bar, but they still ask the same damn questions. Mm -hmm. um, the rules say that the, they're in compliance with the Connecticut Constitution and the Americans with Disabilities Act, but I see people shaking their head. I think we all know. Um, I love this to be a friendly conversation, but if you keep me, let me keep talking, it won't be, so I'll just sit down. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. <laughs> So, Luis, where are we, how are we doing on that? That sounds like a civil rights issue. And as Absolutely. an advocate for people with mental illness, what do you think about that? It goes beyond stigma. It's basic discrimination. Discrimination in housing, discrimination in employment, mm -hmm. discrimination in the ability to pursue your life. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about recovery, but we really haven't talked about what are some of the uh, domains of recovery. And mm -hmm. Megan, if I may use your example, 
Um, sounds like you had stable housing throughout your childhood and, and now in your young adulthood. Stable housing is important. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have stable housing, how can you get ready for school? How can you get ready for work? How can you um, feed yourself and, and have nutrition? Mm -hmm. um, second piece is, is being able to manage your, your illness, both um, physically and mentally. Uh, we, um, Steve mentioned earlier uh, the uh, integration of, of uh, mental health and, and uh, physical health. Uh, we know that that's a best practice mm -hmm. and one that we need to get better at in mm -hmm. terms of uh, providers working better together. Um, the third piece is having a purpose, uh, whether it's volunteerism or whether going to school and having a double major, <laughs> a little too uh, uh, ambitious there, uh, but great. No, she's a little uh, intimidating, right? I know, Mount she Holyoke. is. <laughs> double major at Mount Holyoke, okay. I'm not messing with that. <laughs> but that's great, that gives purpose. And, and whether it's, again, volunteering, going to school, working, and not just working at menial jobs, being able to get competitive employment. Competitive employment that pays a decent wage and competitive employment that um, affords you benefits. Uh, and the f fourth piece, we all need to, and I hope you do this, young lady, <laughs> is um, have recreation and, and, and enjoy life mm -hmm. uh, and have uh, opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, because of the stigma, because of um, the lack of access to services, uh, often people are not able to realize their hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. um Dr. Larson, uh, one of the things that you do uh, in your capacity uh, with NACHOG is um, you have a number of special programs, uh, educational programs for young people uh, that it occurs to me as Luis is talking about supported employment, supported housing, really it's in a way supported education. Tell us a little bit about those programs. Thank you. Um, you know, you're talking about the whole person mm -hmm. and, and Luis did a good job of the dimensions and uh, for kids, uh, their life is around their school and their education. And many times, the behavioral health issues that we're talking about become a barrier, and we have a, way too many kids that don't finish school because of that. Uh, and so we have uh, a fairly substantial school program, as does the Institute of Living. We have eight schools all throughout eastern Connecticut. We educate about 220 or 30 kids a day. Uh, most of the time, our goal is to help them get to the point where they can go back to their school. Mm -hmm. But a thousand kid high school can be fairly intimidating if you have significant problems. And so we have kids that finish with us and get uh, graduate high school from one of our programs. And you know, as a as a leader and as a CEO, um, you uh, would not be uh, totally humane if you weren't moved to tears along with the teachers and the the students and the parents, when you see a youngster that, in many cases, would never have finished high school, finish high school. And they may not go to college, they may get work, uh, they may go to the community college, but they finished high school when they were, they were many people assumed they never would and they were going to be written off, if you will. So it's, uh, I, I think it's one of the most valuable things that we do because it takes into account the whole person, not just the medical, not just the psychiatric, but the educational life of the youngster. And we need to do more of that within all of Connecticut. Senator Bartolomeo, I just want to talk about a couple of the provisions in the mental health bill that you helped to craft and, and to get through the legislature last session. I know some of these things are just getting started now, so we can't really measure how they're doing because they're, they're new. But one of the things that I was very um, struck by is uh, training for school resource officers, pediatricians, and daycare. Mm. Yeah, um, actually, so and some of what's been talked about here is ready to kind of jump in and add mm -hmm. into that. But um, we do, we have a provision in there that if a school has school, uh, school resource officers, my husband, by the way, is a youth detective, so this is something that we've been very familiar with, that they train those officers as if they are a staff in the school and teachers, and so that that is available to them as well, and that's very, very important. Um, as far as pediatricians, the bill that um, came before us in the legislature that had the three components to it, um, that provided for a regional network of psychiatrists, child psychiatrists for pediatricians to be able to consult with. Knowing that that was already there, um, our bill expanded upon that, and we actually have, have some other agencies committed on doing training for pediatricians. 
Um, you know, my oldest son is actually, we went to our pediatrician because developmentally he was hitting his milestones, but he wasn't doing it with the quality with which we expected. Um, up until two and a half, our pediatrician kept saying, oh, he's a boy, he's slower, you know, don't worry about it. Come to find out he has cerebral palsy, which we didn't find out until mm. much later. Um, it was a mild case of cerebral palsy, but I can't fault my pediatrician for not knowing every specialty that's out there. You know, we typically go to them for routine types of things. And so I think that that's, um, you know, we need to not just assume that they're qualified, but we need to give them tools also. There are very simple screenings that when we are doing a normal developmental screening with our children, the pediatricians are doing them with our children at milestones, they can easily do social emotional screenings as well without being in intrusive. And so those are some of the things that we felt it's important to train them on. And if I could just bear with me one more second, when you're mentioning schools and, um, and the prevalence of children with mental health issues going into our juvenile justice system, one other thing that we have in our bill is that we are requiring the um, regional and local school districts, and therefore the State Board of Education to be responsible, to have um, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, with all of our school systems with our EMPS, which is the Emergency Mobile Psychiatric Services, and that's a DCF-run service. Mm -hmm. And also the EMPS should have the MOUs with community health care providers. And the reason we've done that is because we've seen that if a child at school or at a community health center is having an acute mental health um, problem issue, um, that sometimes the police get called first, and that's where we kind of have that slippery slope. And so we, even though this has been available, not all school districts have um, kind of taken advantage of that, so we're now requiring that so there is an understanding of this other service before you get to the police. I think that's um, a imp really important distinction. Um, some people come into uh, finding care or finding treatment or even finding out that there is hope uh, through their faith congregations. And joining us now is Stephanie Haynes. And Stephanie is the Minister of Mission at Gilead Congregational Church. And um, I can't help thinking about the bomb of Gilead uh, and how appropriate that seems. But tell us what uh, you've been involved with and what you're doing, Stephanie. Well, I think I can speak for the faith community when I say that we care deeply about the social and emotional well-being of children and families, and we deeply care about the dignity of all human beings. Um, in our community, it was the events of Newtown that started many discussions around uh, what could be done. Um, and out of those discussions came the idea for a community mental health fund. Uh, the faith communities came together and felt very strongly that no child or family, if they're reaching out for help, should be denied. No child or family should have to decide between food or medications. Um, and so we have this community mental health fund that families can access um, through our Youth and Service Bureau, which is a very important uh, service that we have in our community. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. And as it was mentioned earlier, people want to know what to do, and they want to be asked. And we have asked, and the, the response has been overwhelming um, to this. Uh, we have a campaign called Mental Health Matters, where we're selling these green wristbands. Um, and the proceeds go to the Community Mental Health Fund. But what's more important as people are purchasing these funds, um, there's so many stories about how mental health has affected so many, and they're really good discussions to have. Well, I think it's really, thank you. I think it's really important for people to realize just how prevalent uh, an issue this is and how many families it affects, really almost every family. Um, Marsha, can you stand up and come toward me for a minute? Uh, one of the things that we have in this state is that we have set up a regional mental health boards, and Marsha DeFore is uh, the head of the North Central Regional. What exactly is the role. It's to really dig deep into the community and see what the needs are, or tell me. Right. Well, the, we were created 40 years ago by Connecticut statute, and the purpose was to ensure that at the very grassroots level, um, the services, the needs of the community, the mental health needs of the community, and the services that are designed to address those needs were monitored effectively. And so um, our agency is one of five that does that, and, and um, our membership is primarily folks who uh, 
um, live with a mental illness or um, family members, and then they work in partnership with service providers as well to really dig deep. Um, we are, our members are part of our review and evaluation team, so they um, help us to conduct formal evaluations of uh, services that are funded by DEMAS, um, and um, we then report on those, and we use those evaluations to um, shine a light on things that need to change, but also to influence change and have a great relationship with DEMAS and with the provider community and um, are really able to elevate the voice of people who are living with um, um, an illness or their family members and make sure that their experiences are noted. Marcia, thank you so much. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit more about what's going on in the schools. And um, Eric, Colon Rodriguez, if you wouldn't mind uh, standing up and telling me what you do in the Bridgeport schools. In the Bridgeport schools, we uh, do follow uh, a comprehensive um, RTI model, scientifically based interventions, as Jocelyn said in the first um, uh, intervention. And um, we, we, we address it uh, uh, through tier uh, interventions where, where we look at the behaviors that may be uh, predictive of uh, future um, uh, mental health issues, mm -hmm. for example, school attendance mm -hmm. uh, is a uh, it's a good indicator of of, of a possible um, situation that may be going on and may develop into uh, some type of um, uh, um, uh, mental uh, illness situation mm -hmm. and try to reengage students in the educational process. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I also want to talk to the person who's sitting next to you. Um, Anne, if you don't mind stepping up for a minute. Um, tell me a little bit about AFCAMP, Anne Smith. AFCAMP is an organization that was founded in 1999 um, out of the vision of uh, a woman who recognized the need in the Hartford community of African Caribbean American parents of children with disabilities, that these parents were not able to access the necessary services for their children to allow them to benefit from public education, to access the free and, free and appropriate public education that the law, federal law, um, guarantees to them through the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. And so today, AFCAMP is still working to help parents to be able to navigate the various systems. We've heard this evening about the silos that exist uh, in terms of being able to access the necessary services um, and that there's also questions and challenges around um, the ability to navigate and access equitably these services. And so when we hear from individuals like we did this evening who are professionals, who are uh, well-educated, who have private insurance, and who are at a higher socioeconomic level. Um, you can just imagine um, the challenges that parents face when they have children with disabilities, and uh, they don't have the benefits of a high level of education or a, a, a higher socioeconomic standing um, when they are dealing with, someone talked about uh, recovery being across all different domains. Well, just think about if you're trying to just make ends meet and you're challenged now with a call from school and you have to leave one of your two or three jobs that you're working um, just to try to make ends meet. Um, there's also a concern when you talk about um, mental health services around culturally competent services. You will hear a lot about evidence-based models. What we need to keep in mind is that in treating mental illness, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And we've heard very much about resiliency. You hear about natural supports. Well, these individuals have natural supports. They have built-in networks of supports in their community. Um, they may be faith-based. Um, they may be other cultural supports that exist, and historically, the mental health treatment system has not taken those into account. So needing to 
help our system to develop to the point where culturally competent services are accessible to everyone and that there's equitable quality mental health services available to everyone with the supports is what we work for. Thank you very much, Anne. And I think we've heard those terms a, a, a bit tonight, so I hope that that means that that's starting to become embedded. Um, I, I don't know how many people know this, but if you're in crisis, if you have an issue, whether it's mental health related or lots of other issues, um, one of the places that you can always go when you're looking for help, no matter the time of day or night, um, is 211. And Tanya, I just want uh, people to be aware in our, uh, in our listening audience of what 211 is and how it can help them. Sure. Um, 211 is Connecticut's 24 7 information and referral line. People can call for information on a variety of health and human services. We also have um, all the resource information available online. Particularly for people with mental health and substance abuse, we're finding that a lot more people are choosing to go online to look for those services. I think it offers them some. And, uh, to be anonymous and not feel like they have to um, tell their story to someone before they're ready. But when they are ready and when they do call, we have trained call specialists who are bachelor's level folks who are ready to um, connect folks. You mentioned EMPS, we're the entry point for the Emergency Mobile Psychiatric Services Program in Connecticut. People just have to dial 211. We will um, assess the call and make sure that help gets sent out to their location. A, a clinician provides support and helps them to get connected to wraparound services. And so um, there's many resources available, and people just have to know to either dial us or to go online and um, access the services at www.211ct.org. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to uh, wrap this up pretty soon because we've been talking for well over an hour. But um, before we wrap it up, I wanted to have Stephen Cuddy join us for a minute. Um, we talked, uh, we've talked so much tonight about how people need to tell their stories and they need to do what Megan did and, and explain where they've been and how they've recovered and, and uh, let us all understand how common these issues are among us. And Stephen, that's something that you have done. Yes, thank you. Uh, in terms of recovery, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. People who have mental illness do, do not come forward. Uh, there's two primary reasons I, that I think. One is they feel that there's no hope, that basically they've been in the dark for so long that that's all they're going to be able to achieve, and, and they're hopeless. And, and what I would say to those people is that there is hope, and even though you have no reason to believe there's hope, hold on to the belief that there is hope. The other, the other thing is people don't come forward because they view it as from the standpoint of, well, I, I'm sick, and if I come forward, I need to be well, or else it's not worth it, and I can't be well because that's, that's not possible. But the way I viewed recovery was with, um, with mental illness, that by coming, by coming forward and getting treated, what happens is you don't necessarily have to be cured of mental, of mental illness. You don't have to, you can still re retain it, but manage it. And there are, there are gifts. Uh, there, first of all, there's, you can treat it effectively. Secondly, there are gifts from mental illness. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, Abraham Lincoln, they were, had serious mental illness and they didn't have any medications that they could take in those, in those eras, but yet they had creativity and optimism that they used to raise the world to a higher level. And, and, Therefore, it creates too much pressure for somebody to say, gee, I have to get cured, and if I can't get cured and live like everybody else without depression, it's not worth it, because you can have a normal life with depression and with mental illness, and that would enable people to say, you know what, I can step forward now, because that sets a more achievable goal. I can have a normal life with depression. And the last thing I wanted to say was, there's a wonderful services that we've been talking about tonight, an incredible and what we all need to do and we're starting to do more of is hold hands, all these organizations, and individuals like myself who are not affiliated with an organization but are in recovery of mental illness, basically hold hands with these organizations and we would provide a, a formidable force. Mm -hmm. Stephen, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I think we're going to wrap it up, and I just want, yeah, did you want to say something, Elise? I, I just want to 
put an exclamation point on what uh, Mr. Cuddy said. Mm -hmm. Bringing all these organizations together. This is all about partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, cable wouldn't be where it is today without partnerships. Mm -hmm with the funding from Demas, with the great support from NAMI Connecticut, from, and I think a lot of other organizations can say the same thing. It's all about partnerships, kind of coming together to, say, to problem solve and say, how can we make things better? Mm -hmm. And it's awful hard to try to do it on your own. Yep. But again, by coming together um, as a group with the same types of common goals, you can really make a difference. Senator, what's next for the legislation? What happens in this session? Well, I have to tell you, you know, coming together, this one of the things I'm most proud about with this bill is that it was actually unanimously supported in both the House and the Senate. So you do have legislatures who are now realizing and understanding the importance. What we need to do with this particular bill this session is we need to let our agencies and our providers do their work. Um, we've set up the structure. We have had meetings. I have to say I am exceptionally... Um, impressed, I guess, with the, re the embracing of this legislation by the various agencies. Once this passed, we had a meeting in June where around one large table, we had representatives from seven different agencies, anywhere from one to seven people. And we talked about the fact that, you know what, all we need you to do is keep the lines of communication open. This is not about a gotcha moment. This is about let us know. You're the experts. We've put this upon you. You let us know how it's working. And we had a very clear message that this is not a DCF bill. This bill covers all the children in the state of Connecticut. And so there are statutory partners, and they are all responsible for the success of a um, mental health, integrated mental health system in the state. And what I was so pleased about was at at least three different occasions, we had agencies across the table realizing things that they either are doing in common or that they can help each other on, and they made meetings later on. It was um, really fantastic to see that there wasn't the resistance I was told I would get, and that they are working together and embracing. And um, I want to give kudos out to our agencies. It's a different way of doing business, but it is extremely important and they really are embracing it. So we're going to we're going to wait. We're going to go through this session. We're going to continue to have conversations next October. Um, there is a reporting date, at least for one of the agencies, to tell us how they're doing informally in June. We're, my Children's Committee, which I'm co-chair of with Representative Diana Urban, we will have a public um, meeting, we're not sure what to call it, where they can each report on every section of the bill. Just tell us how you're doing. We're not going to pepper you with questions of the committee. Tell us how you're doing. After we get through all that, then we'll see. We'll see what we need to do, what we need to change, and how to move forward. But they need time and space to do their work. I know that these conversations are going to continue because um, just today, Governor Malloy announced, uh, along with the Department of Children and Families, that they're opening a, uh, a plan that they have banded together with an organization. Actually, I think one of their representatives is here tonight and um, are going to start a plan for how to deliver services to children and to young adults. And there are going to be forums throughout the state that so that consumers and families can be part yeah. of that. That was this bill, and I kicked it off with the governor there this morning, and it was about um, about moving this bill forward, so it was thrilling. Well, it would be good to have those discussions all over the state. Um, Commissioner, I want to just ask you to stand up for one second and tell me, um, you have been in this business a long time, and um, you have been through a couple of administrations. I started when I was 12. <laughs> I didn't say how long. Um, but recently, I feel as though there's some movement happening. Do you, how do you feel about what you're encountering in Connecticut these days? Um, I have to agree with Dr. Schwartz. I've not been in the business quite as long. But um, this is <laughs> the loudest and the most informed conversation that has taken place. Um, it, I actually anticipated that it would stop before this, and it hasn't, which gives me a lot of hope because I think that um, people are really listening and really invested in listening and participating in changing the system. So I, these kinds of meetings, these kinds of forums, and I know they're happening all over the state, are great. I think what we have to do is take what we hear and figure out how to improve the system. As, as Dr. Larson said, the system's not perfect. We've made some changes. We need to continue to grow. We need to continue to work with our state partners to um, make sure that individuals that do have um, either mental health issues or substance abuse issues are able to access 
the care that they need, and then access, or at the same time, I should say, access the recovery supports that they need. It's a combination of factors. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. And um, I just kind of wanted to end the evening uh, close to where we started it uh, with Nelva Marquez-Green. And um, if you don't mind standing up for a minute, Nelva, um, I think maybe we can catch you on this camera over here. Um, Everything that you heard tonight for a woman who has been through what you've been through, but also who is a professional in the mental health field, who is a therapist, what are you hearing tonight that's different than what you heard earlier in your career? I'm hearing, I think, that uh, people aren't going to give up. And I'm remembering that a few weeks before uh, Anna's murder, um, I was with her cuddling in bed one morning, and I was stressed out about something, and she looked at me and she said, Mom, you look stressed. And I said, yeah, I'm a little bit, you know, work. And she said, don't let them suck your fun circuits dry, Mom. <laughs> so I leave you with that as we work together uh, for change and work in hope and in love. Don't let them suck your fun circuits dry. We can do this. Thank you, Nelva. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. I can't say it better than that, so I think we'll close on that note. I just want to thank all of our partners. You've seen them on the screen tonight, all of the people that um, have been so involved in this conversation. And uh, I want to also thank the people at CTN and at the Old State House, and in particular, Caitlin Grimaldi, who uh, produced this conversation tonight. Thank you all for being with us, and um, please do access this again on demand uh, on ct-n.com. Good night.